Hi everyone, I'm restoring an IBM PS1 model 2011 and this is part 2. Here's a quick summary of what you'll see in this video. Powering on the PS1 from my last video to reveal some error codes. Grabbing the culprit, a DS1287 combination RTC and CMOS RAM chip, which is responsible for other issues too. Cutting open that chip, to then solder in a bypass battery. Finally, changing CMOS settings using IBM's utilities to verify that it's working. Let's dive in! In my last video, I gave an overview of the IBM PS1 Model 2011 PC, an all-in-one home computer from 1990 that I picked up recently. Go check out that video if you'd like to see an overview of all internals and components of the machine. From my initial power on test of this computer, in the condition I received it, it thankfully more or less works, though it does come up with these post or power on self-test error codes. There's an error 303 related to the keyboard, but errors 161 and 163 both indicate a failure of the RTC chip. One key side effect of this too is that in a PS1 it prevents the floppy drive from working, and we can't have that. The DS1287 chip is common in a lot of late 80s and 90s PCs, and it provides two functions. One function is the real-time clock, or RTC, which keeps the date and time. The chip's other function is the CMOS RAM, a small amount of non-volatile memory. A mere 50 bytes in the case of this chip, which the PS1 uses for storing BIOS settings, including hardware configuration info, and other boot settings. Both of these functions rely on a continuous power source, and in the case of this chip, that's an inbuilt coin cell battery. The problem is that it doesn't last forever, and it wasn't meant to be replaced when it eventually does fail. Looking at the chip from this IBM PS1, we see a 1990 date code, which means the chip is over 30 years old, well in excess of the 10 years it's rated for. In fact, this part has long been obsolete, which means even that unused, supposedly brand new parts are already more than 10 years old, and hence likely dead too. Note that the chip does still function while the PS1 is powered up, but unless we can get a continuous power source and the chip can retain settings, we'll not be able to get the floppy drive working. While there are some possible alternatives to this chip, I'm going to skip the long lead times and work with what I've got before I try and order a replacement. A popular way to get this particular chip working again is to cut into it, bypass the internal battery, and attach an external coin cell. Note that this technique works also for other RTC and non-volatile RAM chips, including the DS12887 and the Odin OEC12C887, but for any other chips, please do your own research to ensure that it will work properly. Attaching an external coin cell is a sneaky hack that takes advantage of what others have determined about the internals of the chip. The idea is to cut into the chip where pin 16 and pin 20 would otherwise be found. By grinding away gently, layer by layer, a thin strip of metal can be exposed for each pin. Be careful not to grind away too much of this metal, because we'll need something to solder to afterwards. One of the pins does need to be severed, however and so grinding away a bit extra at the top of pin 16 seems to be preferred. Just make sure there's a clean break that isolates the lower part of pin 16, which is what we'll solder to, and to be safe, verify this is at zero volts using a voltmeter. So, if you open up the PS1 and remove the drives and drive tray, then underneath you will find the DS1287 socketed on the motherboard of the PS1, often braced with a cable tie that you can cut. If we gently lever the chip out and take a closer look, we see it's a DIP24 package with a few missing pins. The missing pins are internally connected, including what would be pins 16 and 20, respectively the ground and positive 3 volt lines that are directly connected to the internal lithium coin cell battery. Inside the solid block of epoxy lies an actual coin cell battery, a crystal oscillator, and a DIP24 chip with some of its pins bent up. Wearing safety goggles and with a vacuum cleaner to suck up dust and debris, I carefully cut into the epoxy using a rotary tool like a Dremel to reach the embedded pins 16 and 20 that link up with the coin cell. You can see them here where I haven't gone so far as to sever them. A test with the voltmeter proves there is still a tiny amount of charge left in the coin cell, but nowhere near enough to keep the chip operating when mains power is off. I gently cut down a little further through pin 16 in order to break the connection and hence separate the dead battery from the rest of the circuit. 
The voltmeter confirms, via the bottom portion of the pin, that this is a clean break at approximately 0 volts. I solder a jumper wire to this bottom portion of pin 16, and another to pin 20. Note that any insulated wire will do. In this case, I'm using enameled wire, sometimes called magnet or transformer wire. On both ends of each strand, I've burned off the enamel and tinned the tip, ready for soldering. I have a basic coin cell holder for a CR2032 size battery, which is then soldered to the jumper wires, being careful to ensure that the wire on pin 16 goes to the ground terminal of the coin cell holder, which is the domed part of a coin cell, and the wire on pin 20 goes to the positive terminal, which is the outer, flat, labelled part of a coin cell. This assembly is a little rough, but for now it should do the job. I will try to find another more durable solution later. Pay attention now to the polarity of the CR2032 coin cell as it is carefully inserted into the coin cell holder. With another voltmeter test revealing there are no shorts, it's time to insert the hopefully now live DS1287 chip back into the motherboard of the PS1 system unit. Please be careful to insert the chip the right way around and only while the PS1 is powered off. Before powering on, I reattach the drives and carefully balance them with the drive tray left out, because more fiddling might be needed yet. Now let's hit the power and see what happens. Ignoring keyboard error 303, things look pretty similar, but there has been a subtle change. We see that error 162 now replaces what was error 161 previously. There have been a range of post or power on self-test error codes that I've seen while working on this PS1. Error 163 tells us that either the time and date hasn't been set on the RTC, or has been lost due to a power issue, or that the clock is not incrementing. We were previously getting error 161 to tell us that the DS1287 battery was faulty, but that error is now gone, a good sign. Instead we're now getting error 162, which is to be expected. It tells us that the CMOS settings are incorrect, or can't be verified because of a failed checksum. Assuming that the RTC and CMOS RAM are in fact working correctly, and that the coin cell will continue to deliver power, we should be able to address errors 162 and 163 now by writing fresh CMOS settings. From the 4Quad screen, I go to a DOS prompt and run the configure command. It might show an error message at the top, or it might not. I note here that floppy drive A hasn't yet been detected. The important thing is to press the enter key to save the BIOS settings to the CMOS RAM. I then run the customize command and change one of the settings to see if it holds. In this case, I set the keyboard speed to fast and again hit enter to save the settings. Let's power off. Now I want to see if our battery hack will allow these settings to be retained. I power the machine back on, and now we no longer get RTC errors 161 and 162, only 163 which relates to the clock. There is this new error 8602 which relates to the mouse, but it's not so important so maybe I'll leave that to a future video. In the 4 quad screen, note that the date and time are still not right, which we'll sort out in a sec. Going back to a DOS prompt, I run configure again. Still no floppy found, which could mean trouble for the drive. Exiting configure and going back into customize, we see that the keyboard fast setting has held. With errors 161 and 162 now gone, and our keyboard setting being retained, I'm now cautiously optimistic that our DS1287 battery hack is working. So let's try to fix the date and time issue to address error 163. I run the date command. Hmm, I wonder if I can just put in anything. Nope, let's give it a valid date. I'll run the date command again, and I see that my date has been retained, which is good. I'll likewise run the time command and just hit enter to accept this value. Exiting the DOS prompt and returning to the 4 quad screen, we see it is taken on the new date. Let's power off again. And now let's see if the clock keeps running. Powering back on, we still get errors 303 for the keyboard and 8602 for the mouse, but now there are no more RTC errors. Error 163 is gone. The 4 quad screen shows, after a power cycle, that the date and time are finally being retained and counted. 
Documentation online explains that without a working DS1287, the floppy drive will definitely not work. I had hoped that it would spring to life now, but as we saw recently in the configure command, the floppy drive is still not detected. And if I go back into a DOS prompt again, then try to access drive A, I still see that it reports this error, general failure reading drive A. So at least I've eliminated some errors at boot and fixed the system clock, and I'm confident now that I can store and update BIOS settings and other system configuration. I hope you liked this video. If so, please give it a thumbs up and stay tuned for the next part in this series. In an upcoming video, I will try to refurbish the floppy drive, which will then be our gateway to being able to run other programs on this PS1. Remember to subscribe. You'll be doing me a favour, but it also means you won't be missing out on future updates. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.